Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's start with today's lecture. Today's lecture is about the design of shafts. And uh, as we know that shafts are used in many real applications like in automobiles uh, such as the crankshafts, camshafts, driving shafts and other kind of shafts. Similarly, in uh, motors, in pumps, in compressors, in aircraft, in engines. So, they, they have a wide applications. So, as a designer, we need to design the shaft, which means you have to design the diameter of the shaft, of which diameter is very suitable for the, uh, to the shaft to carry the load. So, uh, to, uh, throughout this lecture, we will see how we design the shaft, what are the key parameters in designing the shaft, and at the end of this lecture, we will solve one problem. And that problem related to the actual uh, scenario in which the shafts are generally used, and we need to design the diameter of the shaft. So, let's start with this lecture. So this is a general overview of uh, how shaft looks like. So we have a shaft with uh, the varying diameter like here we have a different diameter, here we have a different diameter and then we have a retainal rings so that the your element should not move. Similarly you could have you could have broaching on the shaft so we have a broaching. So you can compensate other elements such as uh, gear such as axle and all these things. So shaft can be of different shape, but the most important thing in generally in shaft is, is the diameter of the shaft. As, as you can see in this picture, the diameter actually varies along the length. That is one of the key elements in designing the shafts and in this lecture we will try to find out that uh, how many diameters we can design and why there are more than one diameters and on which, on which parameters these uh, number of diameters are, are dependent on. So, uh, the the shaft design we have a chapter number fourteen from Kurmi and chapter number seven from Shingle. Uh, although this lecture is actually amalgam of both books, so I will just focus you on this lecture. I will just actually advise you to focus on this lecture and uh, just see how we solve those problems. Although the problem that we will solve today is neither in the Kurmi nor in Shingle, but it's actually a combination of both books. So, uh, the, in Khurmi, the, the problem was too simple and in Shingle, it's, it's slightly difficult. So, actually, uh, this lecture has been prepared to an aim that this will be have, have a medium level of difficulty so that you do not have very simple problems, neither you have very complex problems. So, as we know, the shaft is actually a rotating member. Uh, the shaft, that was called shaft. And generally, it has a circular cross section. It's not necessarily the case in all the time, but generally, the shafts have a circular cross sections. And the idea is to transmit power, um, and it could retain gears, pulleys, flywheels, cranks, sprockets, and other kind of uh, elements uh, that can transmit or, uh, or actually uh, power. The axle, in other hand, is actually also a circular member, but the axle is a non-rotating member and it's generally used to support elements like pulleys and wheels. One of the most common example of axle is uh, uh, like the rear axle of your bike. It's like a bolt and the, the idea of this is uh, it, it's cross section is circular. But the idea is that this uh, axle has to support the weight of the bike. So that's why it's, it's, it's a non-rotating member. So, although if you look at the shape of, if you compare the shape of shaft and axle, it actually, actually looks like the same, but the functioning of shaft and axle is very different. Shaft is actually a rotating member, where axle is generally a non-rotating member. Some, some people got confused uh, by the word axle because in cars, the shaft that transmits power from gearbox to the wheel is generally called as axle of the car, but that is technically called as shaft. It's actually a driven shaft, but general in common terms we call it as a axle. Uh, but in more technically, axle is a non-rotating member in, in only used to support uh, rotating members. Uh, shaft uh, can, the elements can, that can be mounted on shafts are gears, pulleys, flywheels, clutches, couplings, sprockets, and other elements, and there could be uh, number of uh, fitting techniques like press fit, like keys, you, you can use keys as we discussed in the first lecture, doubles, pins, splines. So, uh, <coughs> definitely retaining those elements onto the shaft, you need to require certain 
uh, elements, other machine element that is used to retain those elements on the shaft. So, for example, we use fits. Uh, fit could be you can press fit using hydraulic press, or you can use keys, or you can use pins, or or as we have discussed in the keys, like you can use splines, or the you have to also uh, support the shaft because uh, shaft have the actions uh, shaft have forces like gears apply forces on shaft pulleys and all these things so require the reaction forces uh, to be generated and that will be actually generated by the roller bearings generally or bush bearings roller bearings are generally bearings in which the rolling elements are used and bush are generally used which is generally simply a circular cylinder hollow circular cylinder with the grease in it so it can support the shaft so there are also retainer ring the retainer ring is generally used so that the bearing should not move from its place or it should move on the shaft similarly we have grooves we have thrust bearings to support the axial loads so we have one set of element which is used to transmit power which are gears pulleys flywheels clutches and then we have other other type of elements like bearings or retainer rings they are used to support the shaft the shafts could have <coughs> bending load, it could have torsion load, it could have the axial load. Uh, in this lecture, we will more focused on bending and torsion load and we will not see the axial because axial load is generally uh, the design of the, of the shaft with axial loads are generally uh, slightly difficult and the axial loaded shafts are very rarely used in practical applications. One of the applications in which the shafts are used like drill bits. Drill bits actually experience axial loading. Similarly, the propeller shaft of the ships, they also have the axial loading. But apart from these few applications, most of the real world applications generally do not have the axial stresses. So that's why in this lecture we will not focus on axial stress, but we will more uh, focused on bending and torsional load, which is generally about 90% cover the 90% of applications. The material could be, the sharp material should be high strength, it could have good machinability, you can machine it, you can change the diameter or you can use or you can uh, actually machine it in, in whichever way you want. Similarly, you have a low notch sensitivity which means any discontinuity on the shafts could not have a stress, high stress concentration. It could have good heat treatment properties and it could have high wear resistance which means should not wear as there is a sliding on the gear or on the shafts. So, these are the some properties of the shafts. So, the following reasons are generally uh, used. So, shear stresses are generally due to torque. So, what happens is when, when shaft rotates, it actually transmits power. So, for example, let us say you, you attach a shaft from motor to a pump. So, what happens is the, uh, the motor generates the power and that power is transmitted through the shaft to the pump. So, the, the, during the dust transmission of the power from the shaft, from the pump to the, uh, sorry, from the motor to the pump, the shaft actually experiences stress. The stress is generally is a torsional shear stress and that is because of the torque that is transmitted. Similarly, if the shaft is carrying some elements like gears, pulleys or something like that, the shaft also bears the bending stresses because of the weight of these elements as well as because of the uh, load that, that these elements apply on the shaft. So, let us say for example, a gearbox uh, of your car or a bike, it, it has the gears, the gears are mounted on the shafts. So, there was, we have a small shaft, number of shafts that is mounted in the gearbox and these gearbox actually have the gears mounted on those shafts. So, these shafts actually experience the, uh, the bending load as well as the shear load because uh, the gears are rotating, that is why shafts are rotating and the shaft also experience the torsional load as well as the bending load. And in some cases, as we have discussed in the gearbox, we could have the combination of both kinds of loading. We will see this in our uh, problem. Okay, uh, we have discussed this before. So, uh, again the shaft could have torsion load, combined load or bending load. It could have torsion load, it could have bending load, it could have combined load. Again, remember it could have axial load, but, but for the sake of this lecture, we have ignored it. And I have explained earlier that axial load could be in variable application like uh, uh, like drill bits or, or, or the propeller shaft, but, but the applications are very rare in, in practical app, practical life. Okay, though the uh, the uh, allowable working stresses that we actually use to design the shafts generally they are from ASME standard, and these ASME standard says that 
the uh, the if you know the heel strength or the ultimate strength of the material so the your your maximum working allowable stress normal stress will be 0.6 of sigma y or 0.36 of sigma u whichever is less so you calculate both these values and whichever is less you will use that value for the designing of the shaft similarly if you want to find the allowable shear stress so as per asme standard is if that is 0.3 of sigma y or 0.18 of sigma u whichever is less so uh, you have to calculate both and whichever is less is actually used for the designing of shafts okay if the if the shaft experiences only the torsional load which means it has no element like just a simple example i just draw here so we have let's say up a motor and we have a pump here so in between we have a shaft here yeah. there could be a coupling in between to connect two shafts so now the coupling is not actually a a, a, a power transfer is it's a, it's a connecting element so this is a shaft so power transmits from this side to this side so this shaft only experiences torsional load why because this shaft does not have any element like gear pulley or something like that so this shaft only experiences torsional load so the formula that is used to design the shaft is is the simple this relation that we have actually you have seen it now more than i think 100 times is tau r equals to t over j so from this relation you have to find diameter how to find diameter r is simply d by 2 t the torque the j is pi by 32 d4 and when you get this value out this tau is tau r well what you get is diameter equals to Uh, cube root of 16 t over pi tau lambda that you have this you have seen it this formula number of times now if you have a hollow shaft the only difference that we got up our for previous lecture the hollow shaft generally means that shaft is actually is hollow from inside so you have a outer diameter and you have a inner diameter clear so in those cases in the hollow shaft cases the only difference is j is nothing but pi by 32 the outer four minus the inner four and the second difference is in case of radius you have to take the outermost radius which is d not by there is no difference there is no other difference in solid and uh, 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 hollow shaft other than we have j is equals to pi by 32 d4 the outer four minus the inner four and the radius is the outer by 2 so you can see here the so, so this is actually j and this is actually r so if we calculate it for the torque we if we found to find the torque the torque is and in this relation just simply take it on the right hand side just simple mathematics and uh if we just take this d outer 4 uh, as you can see here as a uh, common so we get in a it like this so if we replace this by k k is only d outer over d d inner over d outer So we get pi by 16 pi tau, which is allowable. D in outer cube into 1 minus k for this k is same as here. Uh, as far as the practical applications are concerned, the hollow shaft are only good in transmitting the torsional load. They are not good in transmitting the bending load because bending actually requires a solid cross section. and uh, the shafts are not very good but they are very good in if you want to transmit only the torsional load these shafts are very good in transmitting one of the most common example and you have seen these i think you have seen these shafts the, the shafts of the trucks the truck the, the the large vehicles they used hollow shaft for the transmission so uh, if you look at any if you go to any 10 wheeler truck or any which is they have a differential on the rear wheels a power transmitted from the front engine from the front gearbox to the rear wheel using a hollow shaft but because the shaft only have to transmit torque not any bending load so generally the to the shafts are hollow and generally the common word used for this is the pipe the shaft the truck pipe is broken or the tub, uh, pipe joint has been broken so it's it's basically a hollow shaft so always remember that hollow shafts are very good in transmitting the uh, torsional load and the other reason technical reason is 
this d outer generally is higher and because of this high value generally they can able to transmit because see d outer is um, is in a numerator so it can the higher the value it can transmit more so for the torsion load only yes you can say for rigidity we can use this relation which is t over tau over t over g is equal to d theta by l if if you if you uh, use the rigidity of the shaft for torsion load then you can use this relation to design the shaft so uh, the the other the if you look at the both relations or just right relation here equals to t over j is equal to g theta by l so there are three equal two equalities so you can either equate this or equate this or equate this so here you equated this this is only used when you know the rigidity of the shaft and the length of the shaft if length of the shaft is not generally known you use this relation clear yeah? so that's why and and the difference between hollow and solid shaft is this j for the solid shaft is pi by 32 d4 and for hollow shaft is pi by 32 t outer four minus d inner four Okay, I am not solving these problems because they are very simple. Uh, just to give an idea that uh, the formula is cube root 16 t over pi tau allowable. And as you can see here, the we have 2000 rpm. So power is 20. So power is 20 kilowatt, which is 20 into 10 to power 3 watt. You want to find the torque because torque is used. So torque is equals to um 60 uh, p over 2 pi n i think uh, uh, yes right so 16 to 10 16 to 20 into 10 power 3 divided by 2 into pi into n is 200 we get torque equals to just wait a minute how to calculate it So the so the torque is sixty into twenty sixteen to twenty into ten to the power three divided by two into pi into two hundred. Okay, just wait as we calculate it 20 kilowatt 60 p over 2 pi n p equals 2 pi n p by 60. So we have, I will calculate again. So 60 into 20, 60 into 20 into 10 to the power 3 divided by Just hold on. Divided by uh, two into two into pi into two hundred. So the answer is nine fifty four point nine. So the answer is nine fifty four point nine newton meter. So the tower liable is 42 megapascal. I'm just to put the values here. So cube root of 16 into torque is 954.9 divided by pi is 3.14 and tower liable is 42 is 12 of 6 because we are moving we are using in newtons. <coughs> just to calculate that, just wait a minute. So 16 into 954.9. Uh, divided by uh, pi into 42 into 10 to the power 6 and that is the cube root
that is 0 point 0 0.0487 meter so you can conclude that that is 48.7 millimeter so this is the uh, the design if if only the torsional load is considered for the shaft so the shaft diameter for this 20 kilo or 20 kilowatt is a very huge power it's nearly about um, roughly about 28 29 horsepower so for this kind of shaft we have to use the and the because orbit shear stress is very low like 42 then then the diameter is around 48.7 mm similarly if if <coughs> you have to use solve this again just to give you a hint the shaft is using 1 megawatt 1 megawatt is 1 into power 6 watts rpm is 240 if the maximum torque transmitted exceeds the mean torque by 20 percent so that to actual torque uh, that you are using the design torque is 1.2 times of the rated torque yeah. so first we have to find the torque uh, then we have to increase the torque by 20 percent so just to give an idea here so t is equals to 60 p over 2 pi n again using the same relation here 60 into p is 1 megawatt which is 1 plus power 6 divided by 2 into pi into n is 240 now this torque is very high because 1 megawatt is a very large value so 60 into uh, test power 6 divided by 2 into pi into 240 that's a very large value so 39,000 <coughs> <coughs> 788.7 newton meter so now you are determining the, the maximum torque exceeds the mean torque by 20 percent so the your your uh, uh, maximum torque is 1.2 of t so which means the torque that is you calculated it you have to increase it by 20 percent 20 percent means t plus 0.2 of t which is 1.2 of t so this is just 1.2 of t is 39788.7 so this is your uh, so just calculate the value 1 uh, 397 397 uh, into 1.2 so this is 47746.4 newton and that's the same, same law which is there, you have to use the same relation d is equal to q root of uh, 16 p over pi tau log. This is the case for the, um, uh, for the for the comparison of the diameter of both shafts and just again uh, I am not solving this, you have to solve it yourself. But the idea is the power is 20 kilowatt, the RPM is 200, the ultimate shear stress is taken as so we know sigma u is 360 mega pascal and a factor of safety is 8 so factor of safety is 8 if the hollow shaft is to be used in place of solid shaft find the inside and outside diameter if the ratio of inside to outside diameter is 0.5 so k is 0.5 now first you have to use is use is, is to use the relation which is d is equals to uh, cube root of 16 t over pi tau allowable this is for solid shaft and find the diameter and then you have to use these relation just go back to the hollow shaft uh, yes these are the relation for the hollow shaft so uh, t is equals to pi by 16 tau allowable into uh, uh, the outer 4 into 1 minus k4 here yeah. so you know the torque you know the uh, and you know that k is equals to uh, so just write formula here which will be more relevant so t is equals to pi by 16 uh, just go back to oh, yes pi by 16 sorry tau, tau outer 4 sorry so it's it's going back to the slide okay uh, tau allowable the outer cube 1 minus k 
so if you want to find the diameter outer diameter from here so the outer diameter here is again it's a cube root so it's 16t over pi 1 minus k so pi tau allowable 1 minus k4 now we know k is 0 0.5 T is can be calculated from the RPM and the power. The uh, uh, first you can find the diameter of the solid charge, and then this relation you can find the outer outer diameter. And you know that the inner outer diameter ratio is 0 0.5. Now you can find the inner diameter from this formula. So uh, this is how you can solve if you have the hollow shaft. And this 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 is a very important problem regarding the exam that there could be a problem in which you have to compare both shafts and see which shaft has the, uh, the good uh, capability of transmitting the power. Okay, now we consider the bending load. Uh, from the, till date we have only used the torsion load and for the torsion load you have to use the same relation which is part tau by r equals to T over J. But in case of the bending load, we have to use a bending relation which is sigma b is equals to m y over i or m over z where z is i over y which is called section modulus. So, um, so for bending load we required a moment, we required the distance from center to outermost fiber and we divide the moment of inertia. Clear? The y is the distance from if you have a shaft like this, the distance from center to outermost fiber is nothing but the radius of the shaft, which is d by 2, as you can see here. And the i for the shaft in bending load is pi by 64 d4. So if you put the value here, if you put the value here, m the value of m which is in the same, so m can be written as pi by 32 sigma b into d2. Or in case of hollow shaft, this factor can be added. See, the formula is same till then. This formula is same for solid and hollow shaft. The only difference is we have to use this factor which is 1 minus K4 for the hollow shafts. As we have discussed, the hollow shafts are not good in transmitting the bending load. So, generally, hollow shafts are not used in bending loads. But Yes, there are certain like if, if you are designer, you can say I can design a shaft which is hollow but can be used to transmit bending load, then you have to use this relation. I am not saying that they are not used, they are generally preferred and the reason is because their cross-sectional uh, section modulus is not uh, large as compared to the solid shaft and for the bending load, we required a high section modulus so that bending stress will be less. So, for the case of solid shaft, the, the Z, Z which is the section modulus is generally large for the solid shaft and that is why they are preferred. But you can use hollow shaft for the bending load as well. Okay, so a simple example could be you have a shaft, you have a bearing, bearing is generally used to support the shaft and you have a gears. Now, gears generally have a pair of gears like we have a bull gear and we have a pinion gear, small gear and a large gear. And power can be transmitted from here to here or could be transmitted from here to here. It depends again on the in which application you are using and then your other bearing and your belt drive. Okay. Now, as you can see here, we have the loads that are transverse in nature. So, we have the rotation of the shaft and that rotation actually applies the R torsional load. Okay. The rotation of the shaft actually transmits some power and we have elements like this is gear, this is pulley. So, we have a bending load, these elements actually apply bending loads on shafts. So, these are also called transverse loads. Transverse word is actually derived from the concept that the load direction is perpendicular to the axis of the shafts. So, this is the axis which is passes through the center line, this is the axis of the shaft. So, loads are generally, so if pulley is applying load, it is applying load like this. So, the load is generally in the transverse direction. The only uh, they are discussing the case earlier is the axial case, axial load. Axial load is not discussed in this lecture, but axial loads are in as we have discussed in the start of this lecture is actually used for very very specialized application like I told you drill bits 
or in propeller shafts or in some practical real applications but generally they are not very well used so we only consider the torsion load as well as the bending load so if you look at the simplified diagram here so we have a torsional load represented by this rotational arrow and we have a transverse load denoted by this so there are uniaxial loads only in the one direction so in case of the one direction we have if you consider the mechanics of material if you remember the mechanics of materials so we have an element the stress element on a stress element we know we have a normal stresses on the perpendicular to the faces the sigma xx and sigma yy and then we have the shear stresses sigma xy or sigma yx that is uh, parallel to the faces so if we have a load in only one direction which is again in the vertical direction so we have the one of the uh, uh, you can say uh, a stress is removed because the, there is only one normal stress so we have sigma xx so if you have uh, if you have simple element you can draw more circle again um, the purpose here is not to draw the more circle but to give an idea that more circle can be drawn from from this concept so we we know what is sigma xx sigma yy and tau xy you can actually if you remember from gangster material i think so uh, one or probably two so you can draw more circle and you know that if you combine these two points and just draw radius so radius will be the maximum shear stress and you have the principal stresses like sigma 1 is from this point it will be the maximum normal stress and sigma 2 will be the minimum uh, sorry principal stress so uh, from the more circle you can find the relation sigma 1 equals to which is the principal stress sigma xx or sigma 5 by over 2 plus the radius of circle so this is the sigma average plus the radius of the circle Similarly, sigma 2 to is sigma average minus the radius of the circle. Okay, and, and and I hope that you remember these concepts from the mechanics of materials. As we know that sigma y by is zero in this case, so the formula become tau max or oh, oh, sorry, so sigma. If you want to find the shear stress, the shear maximum shear stress is nothing but the radius of the circle, which is only this formula. In this formula, we sigma x and sigma y by sigma xx is present by sigma yy0 you can ultimately get to this relation now sigma xx in this case is nothing but the bending stress sigma xx in this case is nothing but the bending stress so replacing sigma xx by the bending stress you can actually relate these relations so tau max equals to 1 by 2 sigma b square plus 4 tau square and similarly if you put the value of sigma b which is m y over i or putting the value of m y equal d by 2 and here equals to pi by 64 d4 and you know the tau is uh, here is t r over j r is d by 2 uh, j is here is pi by 32 d4 so putting this value here so you sigma this is your sigma b you can include that this is your sigma b and this is your tau okay so uh, this is the relation in which both both stresses are present which stresses the shear stresses as well as the bending stresses if you have only bending stress you can remove the tau if you have only shear stress you can uh, uh, you can remove the sigma b but we are discussing the cases in which shaft actually has a torsion load which, which the shaft is generally used for and also carrying the some uh, element power transmit element like gears pulleys or, or other element so they also have bending load so the standard relation that is used to design the shaft is tau max equals to 16 over pi tau d cube m square plus t square m is the bending moment and this will be the maximum bending moment and this will be the maximum torque so putting the value here we can find the diameter of shaft from this formula so this is our standard relation for designing of the shaft which means as we discussed in the start of this lecture the idea of designing is to find the diameter of the shaft at different locations as you have seen in the first slide that uh, the um, <coughs> shaft could have multiple diameters could have 3 or 4 diameter in the single length 
so we have to find the, all these diameters so for that we have to use this relation which is again i'm repeating again which is tau max equals to tau max equals to uh, 16 over pi tau allowable m square plus t square so uh, again the same relation uh, here you have to evaluate d from this so d is so just d here is nothing but cube root of 16 into square root of m square plus t square divided by pi tau allowed. This is the design, this is a standard formula for the diameter of shaft. So you are thinking that if this is a simple relation that what is the difficulty in designing of shaft? The difficulty in designing shaft is to find these bending moments. These moments actually take little time to find out and that's why for this M you, you require certain in-depth analysis. The talk however is simply maybe one relation for, 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 for but for the bending moments you have to actually spend some time to find these moments on the shafts and that's why it take a little bit more although it's not very difficult but yes you have seen this in kinds of materials and statics and I think so probably in dynamics as well but it takes a little bit of time to find these moments. As you can see here, the if you if you use the normal stress as your design parameter here, so then this formula can be utilized. So we have additional sigma b here, and then the other relation. This is both are derived from the Mohr circuit. Okay, so a solid shaft is connected to a bending load of 3,000 newton meter and a torque of 10,000 newton meter. The shaft is made from 45 C is steel having the ultimate stress of 700 megapascal, and ultimate shear stress of 500, assuming a factor of safety of 6, determine the diameter of shaft. So, again, this, this you have to use the same formulas. So, bending moment is known, the torque is known, the material is known, the stresses are known, the factor of safety is known. You can find the diameter. So, for this, you, you have to use solve it yourself. The formula that you have to use is this standard relation. That's it. We will see those cases in which we have to evaluate these bending moments. So this is the case for, uh, okay, instead of going into this diagram, we will discuss this in the problem. But let's start with the basic element that is generally very commonly used. So first element, first element that, to, that is generally used is called spur gear. Spur gears is one of the most commonly used gears on shaft and uh, these uh, spur gears these spur gears are generally used like the uh, gearbox of a motorbike actually have a shaft and spur gear similarly uh, these commonly used gears that are used to transmit power are the spur gears spur gears have uh, <coughs> the shape to shape like this this is the shape of a spur gear and we have a pitch circle which is called the effective circle if you remember and you, this, you will see more detail in DME2 in which you design those gears but we have a addendum and dedundum so this pitch circle actually in between the addendum and dedundum so um, this is the point where this is called pressure point in which the load is applied. So we have two kind of uh, so we have um, two forces that exist on the shaft. One is called the radial sorry on the gears. One is called the radial load, which is WR that is applied on the shaft, and the second the torsional load which is applied. Second is called the WT So second load is the WT which is the uh, tangential load So tangential load if, you, if I just draw teeth here the simple teeth uh, it's a simplified model So we have a radial load So this is the shaft So this is the gear let's say I am not drawing other teeth This is the shaft So the radial load is applied in the direction of the shaft and torsion is applied 
so it tends to apply it perpendicular to the gear so we have a normal load which is wn that is passing through this line and the angle between <coughs> the normal and the radial uh, load is this is your wn which is normal load this is called the pressure angle of the gear the angle between the normal and the um, uh, radial load is generally the pressure angle of the spur gear so uh, so you can see now that if i just draw this diagram here so this wr can be expressed okay wt is generally the driving force of the gear so it actually rotates the gear which is nothing but so this type of this is actually a force you can we can evaluate it from the simple relation like torque equals to f into r so this w2 is a force that is actually used to drive the gear and that is equals to torque over diameter of the gear this diameter is called the pitch diameter of gear always in a pitch diameter or effective diameter here yeah, this is called pitch diameter or effective diameter so wt can be find out by using the standard relation of torque over radius of the gear the wr which is the radial load on the gear uh, on the shaft due to a gear is by using this triangle i'm again drawing this triangle so we have wn here we have wr here and we have wt here this is the phi you can see that w r is nothing but w t tan phi yes so uh, yes so if you know w t which is can be found from this relation and phi is the pressure angle generally given so pressure angle stand pressure angle is 14.5 degree for for the spur gear it could be 20 or 25 so it it's, it ranges between around 13 degree to 25 degrees so it could be any angle depending again depending on the shape the size smaller uh, the smaller uh, gears like smaller small spur gears have a less pressure angle the larger gear have a slightly high pressure angle but the range is generally between 13 to uh, 25 so you can find the sigma the, the magnitude of sigma w r as well i'm again leaving this again this is uh, the gear mounted on the simple gear mounted on the shaft so we'll see the case in which there are pulleys and gears mounted both are mounted on the shaft and see the combined case and then it's very so see here is also given the pressure angle is given as 20 degrees so it's also given Uh, this is the diagram for this previous um, uh, figure. So just, just I'm just leaving it for you. You can able to solve. The second uh, uh, element is the chain sprocket. The chain sprocket is generally you have seen in cycles. You have seen bicycles. You have a sprocket, generally called as gear as well, but not practically a gear. It's called a, or it's called a sprocket. और इसे बेसिस में गरारी भी कहते हैं लेकिन बेसिकली इट्स स्प्रॉकेट एंड वी हैव अ टीथ हेयर एंड इट्स अ चेन दैट इज रनिंग ऑन वे टू स्प्रॉकेट वन जनरली स्मॉलर बट इज जनरली लार्जर इन केस ऑफ अ बाईसाइकल वी हैव अ वी हैव अ लार्जर फ्रंट स्प्रॉकेट एंड अ स्मॉलर रियर स्प्रॉकेट बट इन केस ऑफ द बाइक्स वी हैव अ फ्रंट स्मॉल स्प्रॉकेट एंड द रियर बिग स्प्रॉकेट द आइडिया इज द टॉक कन्वर्जन दैट वी रिक्वायर्ड so again we have two um, uh, the force on this uh, because generally we have two side one called tight side one called slack side if this is rotating in this direction so this actually is considered as the tight side of the chain okay and generally on the slack side we have no force because because it's made of generally of metal the, as you seen in bikes and car in in cycles the sprock chains are generally made of um, metal so on the tight side tight generally determined from the direction of rotation so this is direction of rotation this is the tight side clear and this is the slack side the tight side 
it can be find out from using this relation which is torque over radius again the same relation is used as that of gear which is the torque over the radius of the sprocket here again it's 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 basically the, this uh, uh, diameter so you can see you can this diameter this diameter is called the pitch diameter of sprocket okay so that is we have to use in this relation so if, if that sprocket is at certain angle in case of bikes and cars uh, bikes and uh, cycles it is straight with zero angle but like in case of uh, um, these generally used in uh, driving the um, camshaft from camshaft it is at certain angle so so then we have to use this 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 theta so this theta is generally used for uh, that angle, but in case of bikes and cycles, then there is no need to use this angle. It's, it's the same FC that you can be used. Okay. Uh, again, we'll discuss. Uh, we have a tight side and slack side. Tight side generally have the um, uh, the this can be determined from this relation. So this is the uh, rotation. So we have a tight side here. We have slack side. Okay. In case of bikes, uh, the upper side is generally a tight side. If the rotation is uh, uh, and counterclockwise, the upper side is considered as the tight side. The clockwise, the, the lower side is considered as uh, the tight side. So that's very simple to calculate. So if the rotation is anti-clockwise, uh, of, of because both pockets are connected, so both have the same direction. Uh, unlike the gears, because gears uh, generally have opposite direction, two gears are matched together. One is rotating clockwise, other is rotating counterclockwise. Similarly, for the um, but uh, uh, irrespective of the gears, the sprockets both are rotating in the same direction. So, if we have a both rotating in counterclockwise direction, the upper side is considered as the tight side, and we have to find force on the tight side. The slack side force is zero. But in case of the um, clockwise rotation, the lower side is considered as the tight side. Okay, so the third case is called V belt guides. V belt guides again are very commonly used on shaft, like if you've seen motors in your home. One motor is generally called centrifugal motor, which is used in boring, but there is a there is a also a pump which is called the donkey pump. This have a large pulley on the pump side and a small pulley on the motor side, and you can see here that the shaft is actually we have a pulley or, or we have a the shaft extruding from the motor and there is a pulley attached on it. So and generally V belt pulley is one. V belt pulleys are most commonly used now. There are the kind of pulleys like double V pulley, triple V pulley, uh, sorry, triple belt, double V belt. Now we also have in cars we have a ply belts, four ply, three ply belts. These are also combination of these V belts. They are very, they both are small, but generally they are the combination of these uh, belts. In case of belt drives. Because belts are generally made from rubber or a flexible material. Now, although the principle of working is exactly the same as chain of chain sprocket, so this is rotating in this direction. Generally, this is again the tight side. This is the slack side. Clear? Yeah? But in case of the in case of the uh, pulleys, we actually have uh, non-zero force on the slack side because they are made of rubber, and this rubber has the flexibility. These are the flexibility, and that's why the uh, tight side have a larger force, as you can imagine. But the slack side force is not zero. So on the tight side force, we consider as F1 on the slack side. So generally, generally F1 is larger than F2, which means the the force on the tight side, which is F1, is generally larger than the force on the slack side, which is F2. In case of V belts. The F1 is generally five times of F2. This is one of the consideration in V belts, but it could vary again with application. But for sake of your problems, the F1 is, which is the force on the tight side, is generally five times the force on the slack side. And the bending force by the pulley, because actually when you uh, uh, apply, you can see install a pulley on the shaft and you tight a belt. So what happens is it's causing because when you tighten the belt, you have to move this pulley in the away direction. 
so there is a net bending load on the shaft so if this is your shaft of interest that you have to design so if you have to tie this uh, this belt you have to pull this pulley backwards and there there in case of these systems we have a adjustment of tightening those belts like if you remember from generator of your car if you want to install a new belt so in there is a slot for the generator that normally mechanics actually have a rod to tie the uh, the slightly move back the generator so that the belt will be tied and will not slip so this is called a bending load on the shaft and the bending load is generally taken as the sum of both tight side and slack side forces this is the idea whereas the net driving force of the pulley this is the tight and slack side the driving force of pulley is the same which is torque over radius and the bending stress on the load is generally 1.5 times the driving force the driving force the difference of both whereas the uh, bending stress is the sum of both i'm again repeating this concept because that is important the tight side is actually uh, sorry the, the bending uh, load is actually the sum of the tight side force and the slack side force whereas the uh, driving force which is fn is the difference of the uh, the tight side and the slack side and the net driving force which is fn can be found out by same relation as we have discussed in gears and chain sprockets which is p over radius of the uh, uh, the radius of the pulley and, and also in this case we have to take the pitch radius of the pulley these are the just the diagram to show you that the in, in case of the uh, in case of the belt v belt drive pulley belt drive generally the slack side rotation is not zero it actually has certain value which is generally smaller which is about five times as compared to the uh, slack side okay this is a problem that we have to solve this is our last part of this lecture and uh, this is the problem that is given this is by the way one of the problem from final exam and that's why the idea of giving you this problem is that you have um uh, you have a diagram in which you have a gear this is gear b this is gear a they are horizontally placed and this gear this gear this is gear a this is gear b so these are they have a mounted gears and we have a shaft b c and d are on the bearing they are generally used to support it so we call it b c and b d whatever we call it and we have a pulley now this pulley we have v belt pulley drive and this is at certain angle so see this angle from the vertical side is 20 degree so actually we have a pulley that is inclined at certain angle clear yeah. so this is so we have four places at which elements are there so we have uh, gears at location a and b we have bearing at c and d and we have the uh, pulley at e so uh, as you can see from this diagram we could have four diameters at four different locations where the elements are there now the distances of these are known like the distance from gear 1 to bearing 1 is 20 cm the distance from bearing b to bearing c is 30 cm again from bearing b to bearing d is uh, so from from bearing b to or, or to the pulley e is 20 cm and that's also also known so let's uh, let's read the problem and lies and design a step shaft step shaft means it could have more diameters uh according to asme code so we have to use the asme standards for the stress analysis the shaft is machined from aisi 1144 steel so this steel is very common uh 1144 1045 aisi uh these are very common used steel for shafts they have a yield strength of 620 megapascal and ultimate strength of 745 megapascal this is a very high stress because the shaft material generally made of steel with with high grade steel and they have generally dura high durability the shaft rotating counter clockwise uh, supporting two bearings supported by two bearings c and d as you discussed in the scene in diagram receives 20 horsepower from the pinion so pinion a is a driver gear <coughs> connected to electric motor 
so what happens is we have electric motor which is connected to the so we have a motor here which is connected to the this gear uh, this pinion which is small gear and this actually transmit power so power trans power enters here from the shaft and exits from here clear so receives 20 horsepower from the pinion uh, to the the power ultimately delivers to a plastic crushing plant through a chain sprocket so it is a chain sprocket i'm i'm, I'm sorry it's not belt drive it's chain sprocket okay so chain sprocket uh, mechanism at e so so ultimately power enters here and leaves here so if you want to transmit power from this side to this side your shaft should hold this power or transmit this power so now the what data is given pressure angle of the gear is 14.5 degree shaft rpm is 600 the diameter of gear a is 10 cm Uh, again, this, this is the uh, if 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 the pitch diameter is not written, then you consider it as a pitch diameter. Uh, the pitch diameter of gear B is 25 centimeter. The diameter of sprocket is 22 centimeter, and the bearing outer diameter is 8 centimeter. Now we have to find the idea is is to find the diameter of the shaft at four locations, which is at B, at C, at D, and at E. So. Now let's go to our uh, okay. Just hold on. Okay, so let's move to the problem solving. So this is a problem. The only one problem we are we are going to solve today. So let's first see the problem. This is the problem that we have seen before. Okay. So now we start to solve this problem again. I'm just repeating. The idea is to find the um, diameter of the shaft at four locations. for the sake of simplicity i have just using uh, newton per millimeter square in place of mega pascal so all, all of my calculation will be in millimeters it's up to you if you want to use it in uh, sorry uh, sorry i will be in meters so i will be in meters sorry again it's it's your whatever you can take it's it's up to you Okay, as per ASME code, as per ASME code, we have to find. Uh, we know that the tau allowable, which is actually the formula, tau allowable is either 0.3 of sigma y or tau allowable is equal to 1/6 of sigma u. We have to use whichever is higher, whichever is less sorry. ठीक है, for our design. So this is ASME standard. Okay. So tau allowable is equals to 0.3 of what is sigma y? It's 620. So it's equals to 186 mega pascal. And the second tau allowable, just write it with a different color so that. So tau allowable is equals to 0.16 times of, and uh, sigma u is 745. We get an answer of 134.1 mega. So this value is less. So we have to use this value for our design. So this is now settled. Now the next step is to Uh, convert the power into torque because we require torque for that, and this is a very common mistake we have done before. This power is in horsepower. Horsepower is a very common term used in in our country and in throughout the world. But for the sake of technical calculation, you have to convert into watts. So power is equals to 20 into, and you know, and you should know that that one horsepower is 746 watts approximately. So that will be equals to one four nine two zero watts. 
Yeah, it's uh, practically 745 point saying something, but generally 740 is a good good consideration. Now, um, uh, UK we can find talk here, which is uh, 60p over 2 pi n. So 60 into 1. Sixty into one four one four nine two zero divided by two into pi the RPM is six hundred. The RPM is six hundred. So you get an answer of 237.6 newton meter this is our torque now the next thing we have find the power we have actually find the log of stress we have find the power we have find the torque the next step is to draw a free body diagram for a free body diagram i've just drawn it uh, just show you here but you have to draw it in the exam so look at here how we've got a free body diagram so if again look at the problem we have uh, the this is gear a and b this is chain socket clear so this is gear a this is gear b now we have to find forces on these gears. So what happened? This is a driver gear. Clear? So driver gear. So we have a normal force that running through here, which is W N. Clear? So, so you know there is a line that passing through this, which is the normal normal line. Which, uh, on on this we have a W N. And we have a vertical force which is WT. Now WT is always perpendicular to the gear. So if this is the two gear, so this will be WT and uh, this will be WR. So WT is always perpendicular to the, uh, sorry, tangential to the gear. So this is your WT. So in, uh, uh, your uh, angle between Okay, just hold on. I think there is a correction and that is the pressure angle is between the uh, uh, between normal and the tangential component. I think I have just misquoted before. The angle is between the radial uh, between normal and the tangential uh, component. Uh, yes, so look at this is the phi angle, clear? So we have two forces, this is the again the normal force, we have a tension WN and WR here. So this is the action force and this is the reaction force. So what happens if, if this is a driver gear, we supply a force on this gear. So we have, uh, this is the radial, radial component, this is the tangential component. Similarly, opposite to these forces, this gear actually apply a reaction force on the small gear. So we have a, in the same with the same magnitude but is opposite direction. So for example, this is this is WT and this is WR. WR is in this direction, the other gear will be in the opposite direction. This is the reaction load. Leave the direction of these bearings. Look at the direction. So if if we have a central load which is so the bending load which is FC is actually applied at the center of the pulley. So we have two components, one is the horizontal, one is the this component, horizontal component uh, and the vertical component. So if this angle is 20, this must be the cos component, this must be the sine component. The direction of the bearing, because bearing are generally used to support the shaft, the reaction can be taken in any direction. Why? Because when you calculate those reactions, the calculation will tell you either you have taken it right or wrong. 
So for this bearing, I have considered that there will be two reactions, and definitely because there are forces in, in x y plane, we have uh, two reactions in this direction: R C H and R C V. R H means horizontal, V means vertical. And for this bearing, I have taken it in the opposite direction. Again, you can argue that uh, sir, why I have taken on this direction? You can take it in this direction. I have no issue. The calculation will tell you either it's right or wrong. Okay. So the next step from okay, this is this is not necessary that you draw this diagram because it's it's for your understanding. If you don't you don't able to further draw these figures. So what we have to do now is to draw these forces on 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 vertical and horizontal planes. so this is your point b this is your point c this is your point d and this is your point e clear so if i draw a di lines here just for the sake okay so so for this case acha there is a very important concern here that uh, okay the force wn is not considered only considered wt and wr now the main question he, here is which direction we have to use the action or the reaction so so always remember that we have to take the direction of the driver gear okay i am again repeating the direction considered for this case is for the driver gear driver so this is the horizontal plane and this is the vertical plane this is the horizontal plane and this is the vertical plane so see this wn which is actually generated by this driver gear this is the driver gear is actually in this direction so for this case i am drawing in this direction this is wn uh, you can draw it opposite yes you can but then rch is taken in opposite to this so i have just drawn it rch this direction are relative so if the wn is in this direction that uh, will be in this direction ठीक है, so I have taken it in relatively, uh, it must be opposite. If you draw it W and here, for example, if you draw W and here, then you have to R H here. It doesn't make much of a difference to the calculations. Just remember that. Clear? So okay, you have taken this R D H in this direction. This will be same as D W N, which is R D H. So see, we have taken it in this direction. You can take it opposite and just draw it on the above side. No problem. And we have two component. One is vertical. One so in the horizontal component, this is R C H. So F C H. This is in the same direction as that of this. See, so this component is actually in the same direction as that of this. So the um, the direction is horizontal component which is fch this component i'm just drawing the red color this component is actually in the same direction as rch so we just draw it like this fch this is the horizontal plane so what we have done is we have actually splitted those we actually split it those um forces in 3d from 3d plane to a 2d plane so we have horizontal and the vertical so what is about vertical plane so we have one force that is in this direction yeah this is tangential component just draw it here wt 
this component rcv is is actually seems to be in the same direction as that of wt so this is rcv similarly this is actually in opposite direction just write it here r b v and this vertical component again this vertical component actually in downward direction the same as r c v so the the is this this is called f c v clear yeah. i hope from till now you have understood how we have to draw those directions so first of all as far as gears are concerned i am again repeating to summarize this the gears have uh, two kind of forces one is called radial force one is called tangential force the angle between the tangential component and the normal component which wn is called phi which is a pressure angle and we have the tangential component is always tangential to the gear and radial component is always perpendicular to the gear which means along towards the shaft and the only the action forces on the driver gear forces will be considered for our analysis similarly in case of pulleys or in case of chain sprocket you have to see in which this chain sprocket is in this direction so we have two components in the same direction one is horizontal one is vertical and then we have to see the comparative directions of all the components we have to draw it on separately on vertical and horizontal planes this is the idea this uh, and we know the distances in between distances are very important so this distance is uh, just verifying this distance is 20 cm this distance is 30 cm and this distance is again 20 cm okay yeah? similar the case for the vertical plane now these if these forces are known now we have to calculate the magnitude of these forces that is very important now we know the direction it's it's settled now now we have to find the uh, what are the magnitude of these forces and that is very important so let's start with component by component so let's start with the gear so we know that gear tangential force is torque over d by 2 we know from theory so torque okay what is the torque now if you see if all the components are actually on the same shaft so that the torque experienced by the shaft will be the same torque that will be experienced by all the machine elements which is uh, gears and uh, sorry power transmitting element which is gears and uh, chain sprocket if they are mounted on different shaft their torque will be different but they are mounted on the same shaft so they experience the same torque as that of the shaft the torque on the gear is same 237.6 so because i am doing in meters uh, working in meters so diameter of the gear okay now the important thing is and that is very important the gear b is actually mounted on the shaft not the gear a gear is mounted on separate shaft i have to design the shaft this shaft which is this shaft so take the diameter of gear b not the a i'm again repeating always take the diameter a as your design diameter uh, sorry as your uh, uh, not the a yes the a is a driver gear and the driver gear forces are used yes you are right. in this case we are right but the gear b is mounted on the shaft which we have to design so the gear b radius is taken which is 225 cm so in meters it's 0.25 divided by 2 i hope you understand i am again repeating the diameter again is the pitch diameter and the diameter of gear will be considered because always there are two gears one is the driver gear one is driven gear a driver could be on the shaft or on on the different shaft so always consider the diameter of the gear which is actually on the shaft that you are going to design so this come out to be 1900.8 newton and as we know 
that W R is equal to W T tan phi. This is we have seen it before. Uh, so radial component is one nine zero zero point eight newton into tan and phi the pressure angle of the gear which is given is that is fourteen point five degrees. The value will come out to be four ninety one point six newton. So the dominant force here is the tangential force. Okay, the second component which is uh, want to find uh, the forces, action forces is the chain sprocket. So for the chain sprocket, we know that the driving force of the chain sprocket is torque over the radius. Torque is same because again it's it's actually mounted on the same shaft. And radius of the because chain sprocket is one only a single sprocket, so the sprocket is 22 centimeter. So here it's 0.22 divided by 2. So the value will come out to be 2160 newton. Now we know as we rub it, so we just want to see the angle. So this angle is 20 degree. So we know that we have two component. One is here. One is here. So this component is the cos component, which is F C. So the vertical component is F C cos 20, and the horizontal component is F C sine 20. So F C H is F C sine 20 degree, and F C V, which is vertical component, is F C cos 20 degree. F C is 2160 into Sine twenty, sine twenty degree, and the answer is seven thirty eight point eight newton. Similarly, for the vertical component, this is two one six zero times cos of twenty degree, and that is equals to seven sorry two zero two nine point seven newton. Now we have known the forces that are applied on the gear. Now we have to find the reaction forces. So for this sake, I'll just take a screenshot of this. And the idea is that when we finding the moment, that is. Okay. Uh, this is the the page, and I'll just actually rearrange these pages. No problem. So now finally, so we know W N, we know uh, W T, we know F C V, we know F C H. Now we have to find R C H and R R D H, R C V and R D V. So for horizontal plane, summation of forces equal to zero. Summation of forces in horizontal plane equals to zero. So you can say W H plus R D H minus R C H minus F C H equals to zero. So what is not known is this. So R D H Minus R C H equals to F C H minus W H. W sorry not H W N sir W N. So R C H is sorry R C H is seven thirty eight thirty eight point eight and W uh, sorry. That is W R. I am very sorry for that. That is W R. It's a radial force. W N is not considered as a force. It's a normal force. This is W R. Sorry. Uh, just for the sake of correction, this is W R. Okay. Yeah. So W R. So W R. 
W R and W R here is nothing but four ninety one point six. So the answer is. So the answer is two forty seven point two newton. Clear? Yeah. And the second thing you can say is take the moment at around C or at around D. Again to find the summation of forces, the summation of moment around point C, taking counterclockwise is positive equals to zero. So the moment will come out to be. Counter clockwise is positive, so minus W R into I'm using the meter, so 0.2. 0.2 is the distance from this point to this point. Uh, plus R D H into plus R D H into 0.3, which is this into this moment, and we have this again. It's, it's a clockwise, so minus F C H into So <coughs> 0.3, 0.2 plus 0.3 is 0.5, and that is equal to zero. So here W R is known. What is W R? It's 491.6. What is F C H? That is 738.8. I hope with the one step you can find R D H. So R D H. I am writing the direct value because just uh, you have to find this this value. Every other value is known. So R D H is equals to one five five nine newton. The positive value shows that you have taken a correct direction of R D H. Similarly, uh, now R D H is known. R D H minus R C H equals to two forty seven point two. So R C H is R D H minus two forty seven point two. So one five five nine minus two forty seven point two. So you get answer of one three double one point eight newton. Again, the plus sign sign shows that the direction of R C H is right. Similarly, for the vertical plane, for the vertical plane, so. Uh, just going back here, uh, so vertical plane is uh, R D V, R D V minus minus W T minus R C V minus F C V minus W T minus R C V minus F C V equals to zero. So R D V Minus R C V equals to F C V plus W T. So F C V F C V is two zero two nine point seven two zero two nine point seven and W T is one nine zero zero point eight. So you get an answer of three nine three zero point five newton. Taking the moment about point C again with the taking clockwise. I'm just writing the moment directly. So uh, if take a moment around this point, which is C, so W T into point two, and again it's anti clockwise, so taking as positive. So W T into zero point two with the positive sign plus uh, R D V into this again it's anti-clockwise so positive so R D V into zero point three and the third clockwise is this is clockwise R C V into this which is a negative so minus R So the F C V into zero point five equals to zero. Clear? Yeah? So we know W T is two zero two nine point seven. F C V is sorry. 
डब्ल्यू टी इज वन नाइन जीरो जीरो पॉइंट एट एफ सी वी इज टू जीरो टू नाइन पॉइंट सेवन आई होप यू कैन फाइंड आर डी वी फ्राम हेयर एंड आर डी वी हेयर इज टू वन वन फाइव पॉइंट सेवन न्यूटन सो फ्राम दिस आर सी वी फ्राम दिस इक्वेजन आर सी वी इक्वल्स टू आर डी वी माइनस थ्री नाइन थ्री जीरो पॉइंट फाइव मीटर विच इज टू वन वन फाइव टू वन वन फाइव पॉइंट सेवन माइनस थ्री नाइन थ्री जीरो पॉइंट फाइव तो द आंसर इज माइनस वन एट वन फोर पॉइंट एट न्यूटन दिस शोज द माइनस शाइन शो दैट आर सी वी डायरेक्शन मस्ट बी आर सी वी मस्ट बी लाइक दिस इट मस्ट बी ऑपोजिट क्लियर सो मैग्नीट्यूड रिमेन द सेम नो प्रॉब्लम दैट माइनस शाइन शोज यू इट मस्ट बी इन द डिफरेंट डायरेक्शन एंड यू हैव टू करेक्ट इट बिकॉज अगेन यू हैव टू फाइंड मोमेंट वट इज द आइडिया ऑफ फाइंडिंग दीज फोर्सेज नाउ बिकॉज फोर्सेज आर नोन as i told in the start of this lecture the only difference uh, thing we have to find the difficult thing is the moment and for the moments you required forces now finding the moments the moments are only can be find out at the midpoints the edges moments are considered as zero now for uh, uh, ideally you have to draw shear force and bending moment diagrams but because this this mechanical will take so long so i will for your simplicity i'll skipping this you do not need to draw shear forces bending moment diagram but you can draw it you know that from kinetic material theory but for the sake of dme i am giving a leverage that in the exam you need do need not to draw this shear forces bending moment diagram but magnitude you need to find it because if, without that we cannot design the shaft so again finding the bending moment separately horizontal plane okay i just have to Sorry to again uh, transport this. The corrected R, uh, sorry, corrected direction for R C V is this part. We just draw it to the red. This is the corrected direction. Okay, just taking a screenshot so that we can actually it's easy to write moments with these with this diagram. Adding to any equation. Okay. Okay. Now finding the bending for horizontal plane. Take a edges bending moment equal to zero. ठीक है? So mid में निकाल लें. Uh, from this point, इसको यहाँ से निकाल लें. From this bending moment till or इसका यहाँ से निकाल लें. I think so. You get the same one. Just verify. Okay. Just uh, uh, so bending moment at point C is what is R C H? R C H. One three one one point eight. Just hold on. R D V Okay, so taking bending moment at point C is 
at point C is this into this. Okay, so it is clockwise taken as negative. So what is W R? W R is W R is four ninety one point six minus four ninety one point six into zero point two. Okay, yeah. so value will come out to be ninety eight point three newton meter. Similarly, if you take the bending moment at point D, it's equals to either this. Either this into this, or sum of this, it will give you a same answer. So easiest way of finding it is this force into this, or you have to sum all these forces. So this moment minus this moment. So easiest way is to find F C H into this distance. So F C H is uh, it's again counterclockwise. It's just uh, yes, clockwise. Okay. So minus seven. Thirty-eight point eight into zero point two. So the answer is minus one forty-seven point eight newton meter. So for vertical plane, I'm again repeating. You have to take the moment around point. So we are taking around point C and D. So for that, we have to take forces. Uh, again, for at point C, you have to either take this force into this distance, or from the sum of, uh, or on the opposite side, you take the sum of the, of the moments. So the easiest way is to find the moment on the one side. So bending moment at point C for the vertical plane. So again, at point C, it's W T into this, it's positive. So W T is one nine. Zero zero point eight, which is this, into this, which is zero point two, and the clockwise was taken as positive, so that is three eighty point two newton meter. So bending moment at point D is again this is the point D. So take this many moment in the clockwise direction was taken with the minus sign. So uh, this is. So the FCV is two zero two nine point seven into zero point two, and that is four zero minus four zero five point nine newton meter. Clear? Yeah. So just for the sake of verification, we have taken this here. Just see the how we come up with the uh, on the other side. So, if taken this moment around point D, so R C V into zero point three, which is again minus sign, and plus W T into zero point five equals to zero. This is the moment around point D. Okay, so R C V is. RCV is one eight one four point eight one eight one four point eight into zero point three plus WT is one nine zero zero point eight into zero point five. Just to verify that, just to uh, we have good confidence in the theory that you have to find bending on both sides. Answer will be the same. So one eight one four point eight into zero point three minus Minus one nine double zero point eight into point five. The answer is minus zero point four zero point five point nine six meter. 
this is giving an idea that either you take bending moment on the by taking a simple force in this direction or the technical or the summation of forces in on this point the answer will be the same this is the verification you do not need to do it on, on in the exam but if you want to take the bending moment at any point take the nearest force and just find the moment for single otherwise the moment is same from both on both sides i think hope will be clear now we have a, we have come up to the almost the end of this problem now we have known the bending moments uh, at the next step this is i'm rubbing it because this is not required the next step is to find the resultant bending moments in both planes oh sorry uh, resultant bending moments in on the same point so bending moment at point c is equals to bending moment at point c in the horizontal plane plus bending moment at point d in the horizontal plane uh, sorry in the vertical plane c theek hai so the bending moment at point c is 98.3 square jama uh, in vertical plane it's uh, 380.2 square under root why because see there is a bending moment in the horizontal plane in this direction and the vertical plane in this direction so we have to take the resultant which is simply the vector sum okay so the total bending moment at point c is 392.7 newton meter similar is the case for bending moment at point d which is the resultant bending moment is again the bending moment so just draw it here h h v v so bending moment uh, at point d in horizontal direction ka square plus bending moment at point d in vertical component ka square so horizontal is minus 147.8 square jama uh, minus 405.9 square so the net bending moment is 431.9 newton meter see we have to take the highest bending moment here the highest bending moment is at point d no no sorry 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 uh, to the highest bending moment we have to take the bending moment at each point to find the diameter at each point so the bending moment at point a is 0 b is 0 the bending moment at point c is 392.7 newton meter the bending moment at point d is 431.9 newton meter and the bending moment at point e is zero because they are the edges of the shaft okay so the next step and probably the last two steps is now to find the probably yes it's the last step to find the diameter of the shaft at each point so at point d the formula that we have to use is we have discussed this in this in in starts start, starting slides of this lecture is bending moment square plus torque square this is we have to write it m but m or dm is the same thing now at point b there is no bending moment so the answer is 16 our pi tau liable it came from asme code Which is 134.1 into power 6. You have to take the lowest value. Uh, yes, you have to take the lowest value, which is 134.1 into because bending moment is zero, so the torque is 237.6 square. This will be cancelled with this square. The diameter will come out to be. 0.02164 meter so we can take it as 21.64 mm or round off to 22 mm this is the diameter at point b so diameter so d at point 
uh, C. The I, the formula is same. Cube root of 16 over pi into 134.1 into 10 power 6. Now we have bending moment at point C, which is 392.7. 392.7 square plus 237.6 square. So the D will come out to be at this point will come out to be 0 0.0269 meter which is equals to 26.9 millimeter approximately equals to 27 meter. so d at point d again the same formula And now we have the, the bending moment at point D is 431.9. 431.9 square plus 237.6 square. Talk remain the same. The diameter will come out to be in this case is to 0 0.0275 meter which is in fact 27.5 millimeter or 28 millimeter and la last but not the least is the D at point E at point E we have no bending moment which is 0 so the cube root of 16 over pi into 134.1 into 10 to the power 6 so no bending moment but the torque is 237.6 square so diameter will remain the same as that of point D which is 22 millimeter so this is how we design the shaft uh, at four different locations at which four different elements are located uh, I hope you understood this problem uh, I will upload the uh, problem of uh, uh, solution of another design problem of the shaft so you will have more comprehension and and uh, I hope when we come in the class you will have seen this lecture and if you have any problem uh, in the solution of this uh, uh, problem we will discuss in the class the last thing that I want to uh, mention here is as far as pulleys are concerned if there could be three elements gears pulleys and sprockets n not more than that so if pulleys are come inside of sprocket, the only difference between pulleys that you have to find the bending force and the driving. So you have to find the driving force, which is F n, and that is uh, T over D by two, and then bending force, which is the actual force on the shaft, can be related from the driving force. So I will upload one of the problem in which we have actually used the belts instead of sprockets. So then we have a more comprehension in the uh, understanding. I hope you understand this uh, lecture um, uh, and if you have any problems you can approach me on WhatsApp or uh, the good thing is you will come in the class inshallah um, on 8th uh, of the week starting from 8th January then you can discuss these problems in the class. Thank you very much for your time. Allah Hafiz.